I'm all for stirring up the scene a bit. Welcome to the KOV video and I'm happy to present you these controversial topics, more specifically box and papers, investments and unpolished. Now if you don't agree, they might be unpopular opinions, I'm happy to hear why, not before you hear all the facts. And we're going to do so in my favorite strip joint, Club Bonton. Starting off with something that actually has little to do with watches itself, box and papers. And people are usually surprised to hear luckily not as our response to their question if those are included with a watch we offer. Allow me to elaborate. I would like to start with an important reservation. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a watch if it does come with the aforementioned additional accessories, but I am saying that you should not let a deal depend on it. Let me take it one step further. I'd rather buy a watch without, since it most likely have to pay less, or I can use that budget on better condition or more interesting configuration. After all, I'm passionate about the actual watch, not about some paper and a cardboard box. It is up to you to decide to what extent you think I'm right, but let's get the facts out there. Now I also understand that it can feel sketchy if a modern timepiece doesn't come as a full set. By now, most consumers in the luxury market keep everything surrounding the object itself. I wouldn't not buy a modern watch if everything else checked out, but for some it might raise doubts. However, the habit of holding on to box and papers wasn't common at all until quite recently. After all, most people don't keep that stuff when they buy a vacuum cleaner for instance, and same goes for warranty papers, most threw it out after it expires since it didn't serve a purpose anymore. Moreover, manufacturers didn't intend for boxes to be kept for many years, they were merely used as packaging material usually made of cheap and perishable materials like cardboard, pleather and plywood. Just have a look at your average Patek, Omega or Giger de Coultre box from the previous century. You can almost see them disintegrate before your very eyes. It is uncommon for someone to have kept the original box and papers for decades and as per usual in the world of watches, if something is rare, it becomes desirable and thus valuable. Occasionally, box and papers can command premiums up to 25% most notably regarding vintage Rolex watches. So are you being swindled if you decide to pay up? Firstly, let's debunk a common misconception. Boxes nor papers guarantee originality. They don't tell you whether a watch is in an altered condition or even genuine at all. You could have a Rolex where the serial matches the original papers, but with all components of the watch being changed. The dial could be a service placement, it could be refinished or even completely aftermarket. Or worse, the serial number from the original papers could be re-engraved into any watch, genuine or fake, if the papers are indeed original in the first place. While Swiss precision is often copied but never duplicated, the same can't be said of warranty papers or cards. Banknotes are created with all kinds of anti-counterfeiting features, but there are still organizations out there that can fake them so well that most wouldn't be able to tell. Now imagine the money that can be made by counterfeiting a warranty paper that was never made in a way that would prevent people from faking it. I've held an original Rolex warranty certificate in my left and a fake one in my right hand and even I had difficulty separating them despite years of experience. The fake paper even smelled vintage because they were kept in an old book for a couple of months. Besides fake papers, there are also many original papers that were just never filled out. You can buy them by the dozen at any watch fair or even online. It'll cost you a couple of hundreds, but can add thousands in value. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? And before you start about the so-called punch papers from Rolex, vintage punch machines have notoriously been sold online alongside dealer stamps, which too are being duplicated. In other words, it's not that difficult to produce 100% correct papers and nobody will be able to prove they're not original. Just add a period correct box, some booklets that you bought off eBay and voila, you've successfully added some serious value to the watch. After extensive research, it's safe to assume at least half of the Rolex watches with paper produced prior to 1990 are currently supplied without the certificate they were actually born with. Therefore, if anything regarding confidence, being offered a vintage Rolex with papers makes me more suspicious. Some brands also offer extract services or even reports of authenticity. This alongside service papers may be considered. Next up, I would like to tackle the argument that a full set is a better investment. The value on the secondary market is a result of supply and demand. Whilst the supply of vintage watches with warranties magically increases, the demand diminishes because people start to realize the scam, resulting in a declining premium at best. 
Another often made excuse of limiting purchases to full sets is that it would be easier to sell. After this plea, you might consider that as arguable. I'm also denying the claim of some that true collectors to see complete specimen, hence the term collector set. But all the aficionados we know, and we know a fair share, wouldn't ever pass on a deal for a rare and sought after watch due to the absence of these irrelevant things. I get that box and papers can add a feeling of authenticity and romance to your watch, and sometimes it may indeed indicate that the previous owner took great care of his prized possession, and surely you should pay whatever you think something is worth. In some cases, I too would pay a couple thousands extra. I like the colored accessories coming with the beach, Daytona said, the Kirky Tudor peanut box or the Omega crater box, for example. Some cool provenance of the previous owner is appreciated too. But especially with vintage Rolex, the premiums are justified for all the wrong reasons and simply too high. Do as you please, but let this serve as a caution. And remember, you can't wear a box and or papers. Over to our next subject, investments. And regardless of what you've read or heard, generally speaking, wristwatches are a terrible performing asset compared to the Dow Jones, metals, real estate, etc. Bear in mind the majority of timepieces plummet in value after purchase. Think about that Armani, Versace, Tommy Hilfiger stuff. And not only did cheap watches show tremendous downside on the resale side, how about Hublot, Panerai, some highly complicated pieces from brands like ADBC or the lion's share of bejeweled executions. With that being said, the luxury watch market, in particular the established brands and more recently independents, potentially have an interesting ROI. Yet it's easy to discard pieces as a bad investment, but nobody can answer you what's the best investment. Any dealer claiming this and selling you a watch as such is full of bullshit and should be avoided at all times. Even if one would be able to answer that question, why would he be selling it then? Now the interesting question arises, should you speculate with watches? I would always prioritize an investment in your enjoyment rather than financial gain. I think it's great many of us can enjoy such wonderful products, often without losing money and occasionally even making a good buck on it, preferably to use on your next purchase, but it feels a bit poor to ultimately let that be the decisive factor. It strikes me as odd to think about the resale during your buying process of such an emotional purchase. So do we as professional watch dealers never buy watches as an investment? Trading watches is capital intensive, so for us cash flow is king. From time to time, we purchase sleepers, a watch we believe the market isn't aware of its importance yet and therefore is undervalued. A lot of factors come into play to predict if and by what extent the market will pick this up. But throughout our following, we can create more appreciation and make market in an ethical way by advertising it as a so-called value buy rather than just following the market or even worse, manipulating market. It isn't hard to manipulate the market. With the right capital and connections, you can exercise a lot of influence on the price by the good old cartel model. Adding insult to injury, most unexperienced rely on Krone24 for the current market price, failing to realize the difference with the actual going rate of a model, which in some cases is far apart. This isn't some far-fetched conspiracy theory. It happened rather recently with contemporary hype models. The bull market wasn't fueled by passion, but merely driven by potential profits with the dealer frenzy in the mix. So if you do want to get into it, you have to realize the risks. I'm no financial advisor, but happy to tell you about the pros and cons compared to traditional investments. Let's start with the positive aspects. First and foremost, a watch is something you can enjoy physically. If you were to invest in alternative assets like wine or whiskey, the value disappears once the bottle is opened. Watches might also be more accessible and enjoyable to learn about than the stock market, and to many it has a more comprehensible intrinsic value. Lastly, it is possibly more anonymous and less transparent, which might be interesting for tax purposes, but the lack of transparency can also be a pitfall in the buying and selling process. Which brings us to the downside of investing in watches. This asset class offers lower liquidity and higher costs, like maintenance and transaction fees, and risks. It can get stolen or it can get ripped off if you don't have any knowledge and or trustworthy connections. It also demands more capital to start with a diversified and less volatile portfolio. Properly investing in watches whilst hatching as much risk as possible requires at least tens of thousands of euros. Last but not least, is something that is the most dangerous part, but simultaneously the most attractive. Emotion. And my heart and my wallet are oftentimes not cohesive. My advice would be to buy what you like for the amount of watch it's worth to you. Then you can never lose. Fuck the market. Enjoy your watch. 
The topic of unpolished is up next. One of the most frequently asked questions is if a watch is unpolished. In many cases asking this exposes your lack of expertise and experience. Nothing wrong if that does apply to you, but there are many dealers out there trying to take advantage of gullible buyers. Some of you may be outraged or offended by this, but I'm spreading my views for protection purposes. Winning information prior to your purchase is the right thing to do, and by extension asking the seller questions is a method that should be applied sensibly. So let me explain why this isn't the right thing to ask when buying a vintage watch. Many have read somewhere the subject is relevant or even mandatory, yet fail to realize that unpolished isn't a condition standard at all. If you aim at a new old stock example, it's wishful thinking for most popular brands. Tool watches especially, disqualifying 99% of them and leaving the few exceptions in a different price bracket. Regardless, a watch can be unpolished but worn out or properly polished but in pristine condition. A resume, rather the degree and quality of polishing is of importance. Overpolished, however, is a condition standard and only let specialists do the job. Some artisans are so skilled they can make it appear mint. Even brands themselves offer laser recharge services like AP, Patek, some Rolex centers like Bexley and subsequently it sadly is sometimes advertised as unpolished by the seller or some auction house. It is very hard to determine the difference between truly unpolished and refurbished, even if you have cognizance. Condition is of the utmost importance, but I hope you now realize asking if a watch is unpolished has little to do with that. Thanks for listening to my rant. I hope I was able to back up my views that were formed over the past decade in a logical manner. You do not have to share my thoughts. Even more so, I invite you to share how our opinions differ. But please present a substantiated claim in a professional fashion. That way we can all learn from each other.